Hello and welcome to Tech Talk. Me, Anthea, will co-host for me, Kenton Milroy. Okay, welcome back to another Tech Talk uh, episode. Lo television, lo Vanuatu, and we broadcast uh, lo region, lo Pacific region, lo channel 56, quarter to seven every Sunday. Uh, me, Kenton Milroy, me host for you lo this for uh, Epinic 46, lo Numea Nouvelle Kanidoni. Bonjour. Uh, so far, lo this for uh, Epinic 46, you got plan to talk, only been come up on uh, very interesting talks about technology, uh, lo various uh, speakers. But lo this for the time with them, uh, me, lo this for the show, me, uh, uh, chief scientist, lo Epinic, and uh, me one early pioneer of lo uh, internet, lo Asia Pacific, and uh, me one Australian, uh, I mean, a new lo uh, telecommunication ICT sector. Uh, I mean, I got, I mean, writing full of book about IP, IP technology, uh, and then I mean, writing plenty blogs and columns about uh, uh, development of uh, technology in Asia Pacific. Uh, Jeff Houston, it's good to have you on the show. Thank you indeed, it's fun to be here. Uh, the show is, uh, will be specifically in the Pacific context. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Pacific is, uh, is scattered, Pacific countries are scattered throughout a big, fast ocean. And uh, in Vanuatu, uh, it's uh, 83 islands scattered over from north to south up to the Solomons, then down to New Caledonia, and then our closest neighbors, you know, Australia and uh, New Zealand. Uh, ICT development uh, or telecommunication development is not as fast like uh, our two developed nations, New Zealand and Australia. We're still finding and fine tuning a way of venturing out there and having good systems in place. Uh, you've been a pioneer and a chief scientist at APNIC and you've been in the region, uh, been involved in a lot of these uh, technological development and breakthroughs and especially research. Uh, tell us about yourself, your work, and then uh, we'll further the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, I uh, started working in this area almost by accident. Um, I was inside the university sector in Australia yeah. in the late 1980s. Just at the same time, as over in America, they were doing something called the High Performance Computing Initiative mm. that was quite groundbreaking at the time, and it tried to take these eight supercomputer centres, big centres, <laughs> and connect it to, I think, two or three hundred universities across the entire country wow. with a new scale network. Okay. The National Science Foundation funded a thing called the NSF Net. The National mm -hmm. Science Foundation yeah. Network. Over in Australia, we saw this and said, we want one too. Now, we weren't the only country, the Japanese, the Malaysians, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of other folks saw the same thing and said, we want to do this too. And so the university sector in the late 1980s was sort of put under pressure in Australia. How can we do this? Now, I was certainly vocal about ways of doing this, and I was lucky enough to get given the job of building one. So across 1988, 89 and 90, mm -hmm. my job was to actually take whatever was there, yeah. hook it all together, bring the money together, and bring the sort of arrangements together to create an internet in Australia. Okay. Little did we know how well we would succeed. None of us understood mm -hmm. that within five years, this would have just gone out of control. Mm. That what we were doing was being sucked up by people who'd been waiting for years for this kind of development. Mm. All of a sudden, computers, instead of being word processors, mm. are windows into a world of information. I don't need to go to a library. I can look at Wikipedia. You know, all of the things that we take for granted today about the internet yeah. were just being invented and discovered. And it was an incredibly exciting time. Mm. And it was almost as if whatever we did generally mm. was successful. And so the university sector started selling its services to many mm. others. Yeah. And it became pretty obvious pretty soon mm. that maybe this was bigger than just universities. Maybe it was more than academics and researchers and libraries. Mm. Maybe this was about everybody. And so in the mid 90s, I actually joined Telstra. And in fact, the university sold this emerging internet to Telstra. Okay. And the goal was simple. Everybody. Mm. 
Every company, every enterprise, every government, every school, every hospital, everybody. And we achieved that. Mm. Within five years, by 2000, wow. everybody really was. Mm. And today, it's certainly an interesting topic. Yes. But up comes this investment in Australia, the National Broadband Network, mm. and it's now everybody on fibre. The NBN. The NBN. Mm. No matter how you think about its implementation, mm. that's a big scheme. It's almost the same as 100 years ago, everyone on the telephone, mm. copper. Yeah. This is taking a view that goes out for a century mm. that says, I don't need to bring people into work environments. Mm. I can bring work environments to people. Okay. I don't need to build big infrastructure in cities. Mm. You can play a role in whatever you choose to do wherever you choose to live. This is, an, I think, an amazing development for the country. Yeah. And I think for any country, these days the assets you need mm. are as much about a rich and capable and affordable digital infrastructure yeah. than roads and bridges and airports. For, for a country the size of Australia, it's a continent. It's almost like you know, 10 hours flying across from east to west. It takes a while, yes. Uh, uh, NBN, that NBN initiative for development. Uh, what are the, who, who are the major stakeholders in that uh, program, NBN? So, in, in this case, the government is underwriting this. Okay. The basic sort of fundamentals are actually really quite simple. It costs around two to three thousand dollars to connect a house to fibre as long as there's houses on either side so it's okay. relatively dense mm. seven million dwellings you can start ending up the numbers yourself and mm. it becomes relatively simple you think that's a lot of money but hang on every single house has clean water okay. every single house has electricity every single house has sewerage we've already done this mm a number of times. We've even done natural gas in Australia. Mm. Fibre isn't anything new. Um, the words digital shouldn't really alter the fact mm. that this is actually a pretty standard rollout. Mm. And ultimately, the real beneficiary is the person who owns the house. Yes. Because when my house has power, water and fibre, mm. that's actually a more desirable property, isn't it? Yes. Because I can do more. Yeah. I, you know, that I can work from home, yeah. I, can, you know, I can do a whole bunch of things mm. that my neighbour who didn't have it doesn't. Mm. So when we rolled out copper, it was everybody. Not just those who could afford it, everybody. everybody. And the NBN has a similar view that if it's going to be everybody, the government's going to do it. Why? Because even if folk can't afford it, we will do this. Okay. Because the true benefit of this kind of digital society yeah is again, everybody, everybody, not just the rich, yeah. not just the companies, not just the privileged few, mm. it's everybody. Yeah. And, you know, I applaud the vision behind that. Mm. Um, as I said, the implementations, we're all technologists, we all have opinions, mm. and that's okay. Yeah. But the ideas behind it had to be done. So when I relate sure. this to the Pacific, yeah. in Australia, the problem was the continent. Yeah. It's a one land mass. It's a one land mass. When I look at the Pacific, it's all the bits of water. Yes. So now, we're dealing with both land and water. Land and water. And, and sometimes it's all one country, sometimes it's different countries, but it's the water that's the problem. Now, there are a number of ways of getting across the water. Mm. You go up into space and back down again, or you go along the bottom of the sea. Uh, come again? You either use satellites, satellites and radio, you go up okay. over and down, down, back down again, or you just drop fibre optic cable on the ocean floor. When fibre optic cable's on the ocean floor, the expected lifetime is around 25 years. Yeah. That's amazing. Hmm. When I put a satellite up into orbit, it has a certain amount of station keeping fuel, electronics, lifetimes. You're lucky to get 10 years out of it, probably hmm. less. Yeah. And because you're using radio mm. and everyone else is using radio, mm. no matter how you try and push this, it's never an attractive proposition. Okay. 
the costs are high, the benefits in my mind are mm. low. Now, the satellite folk will argue with me, and you know, great, it's a great <laughs> argument. Yeah. Um, but I must admit, unashamedly, I think the current wave of investment in undersea cable mm. in the Pacific is brilliant. So that's a very good uh, point. I like the way how you put it in a, a simple uh, uh, way of explaining things, like an island, an island is a sea here or water. Yeah. You go over or you go under. Uh, there is a uh, uh, Australian uh, Sydney Honiara cable. They call it Coral Sea, yes. which is uh, going to be built by Focus subsea uh, submarine cable going up and it's going to be completed somewhere around in 2019. Mm -hmm. And Vanuatu is, because of that connection, uh, Vanuatu is also building its second cable to meet the Sydney Honiara cable. So that, that means we now have redundancy backup cable. Our first cable is to Fiji. Uh, Fiji is well ahead in terms of the Pacific Island nations when it comes to internet, uh, they got good internet bandwidth speed and also prices for you know users consumers yeah. uh, New Caledonia we uh, we are about to we are in discussion with New Caledonia to for the TED cable and uh, several other Pacific countries like Tonga and then Samoa they all now have submarine cable uh, the connectivity is moving in right momentum uh, what are some things our government supposed to be aware of in making the welfare and the homes of people. So, so let me roll back with your comment about Fiji. Yeah. And they enjoy good internet at low price. Mm. But if you were to say the same thing in 1995, that would be wrong. Because in 1995, everyone was on satellite. Yeah. It was all expensive everywhere. And Fiji was no better or worse off than anyone else. Mm. So what was the change in Fiji? I'll tell you one thing. Southern Cross Cable, because all of a sudden, hundreds of megabits, gigabits, mm. possibly even terabits, mm. of capacity from between Australia and New Zealand and America surfaces in Fiji, okay. and the Fijians tap into this cable. Yes. All of a sudden, bandwidth produces results. Yeah. Cheap, plentiful digital access. Yeah. And so Fiji and its bent citizens mm. enjoy a level of service that everyone else goes, well, why can't we? Okay. And the answer really was yeah. Southern Cross Cable. Southern Cross Cable. Because when you put in a cable, mm. fiber optics is truly awesome. Yes. Um, we used to talk about millions of bits per second, megabits. Yeah. We now talk about thousands of millions of bits per second, gigabits. Mm. Fiber optics bigger than that. It's literally millions of millions of bits per second, mm. terabits. 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 True. So all of a sudden we can connect these massive capacity systems. Mm. And the real issue is actually a financial issue rather than a technology issue. Yeah. This thing has a lifetime of 25 years. Do you want to make your profits in one year or over 25 years? If you have the right financial arrangements, mm. All of a sudden, you can amortize, you can spread the cost yeah. across years of future development. Mm. All of a sudden, this thing that looked like a $200 million expenditure, over 25 years, mm. and over the economic benefits you're going to generate out of that, yeah. becomes almost minor, even if you're a country of a few thousand citizens. Yeah. Sure. So this wave of building mm. is actually, to my mind, the best thing Mm. that governments could assist with. Why? Mm. Because governments have access to capital that private capital does mm. not. Mm. Investors in private capital want their returns quickly. Yes. Because they think the Pacific is high risk, they want 20% return on their money mm. each year. Mm. Citizens have to pay. Yes. Once you use development banking sources or public sector sources, mm. all of a sudden the return rates on investor capital can drop as low as 5% mm. because the government is backing it, the mm. risks drop down. Drop. Mm. When they drop, you're amortizing the cost of that capital infrastructure mm. terabits <laughs> yeah. over decades. Mm. And what looked like a forbiddingly expensive project becomes, well, why don't we? And I think there's more to it than that mm. though. There's a lot more. Mm. 
because we used to build systems almost in isolation. Yeah. The government of Tonga has all of its computers in Tonga, all of its data centres in Tonga, and there's not many people there, yeah. and there's not a lot of infrastructure. Mm. Why are we replicating this on every island? There are huge data centres on the west coast of the US. Yes. There are massive ones in Sydney, huge ones in Singapore. Yeah. On cable, on cable, they're only 110 milliseconds away, one-tenth of a second. Mm. As humans, we don't notice that. Yeah. Now, I can spend a million dollars building a data centre somewhere on a small island in the South Pacific. Unreliable power, mm. huge issues with, with you know, the entire environment. Yeah. Or I could take a hundredth of that money and buy capacity in a data centre in San Francisco. There's a thought process that goes on mm. saying, my citizens' data, my national data, I don't feel comfortable. Yes, that's true. Mm. You should, it's, it's, it's out there and yeah. it's not a directly under yeah. our control. But in some ways, control and cost are variables in a trade-off. What gives you the greatest benefit? What risk are you prepared to tolerate versus what price? Yeah. And to my mind, I must admit, in, in the computing game, volume is everything. Volume, yeah. Volume gets you prices that are so low. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why Amazon wins in so many places. Yeah. They're just big. And maybe when we think about digital government, digital health records, mm. putting a huge amount of our communities and societies' assets into ways that mm. help us do things better, more efficiently. In one other way, we call it e-government. E-government. E maybe you'll, you'll be comfortable mm. in taking a solution that offers you resilience, capacity and protection, mm. but not necessarily on your borders, within your borders. Yeah. And that's the kind of difficult decisions. And I admit they're not easy. Mm. But in some ways, you've got to do what you can afford True. and find ways to afford yeah. what you need to yes. do. So outsourcing some of this stuff into mm. data centers just seems natural to me, I must admit.